Hello and welcome to our look ahead at what's in the papers tomorrow morning. Uh, with me here in the studio to look through the front pages, we've got the chief leader writer for The Observer, Sonia Soda, and the Whitehall correspondent for the Financial Times, Sebastian Payne. Welcome to you both. Thank you Thanks. very much for being with us. Uh, let's take you through tomorrow's front pages then, many of them already in, most of them leading, of course, with those new Brexit proposals from the Prime Minister. The Metro goes with Boris Johnson's letter to the EU Commission uh, President Jean-Claude Juncker outlining his conditions for a Brexit deal. Daily Telegraph says Boris Johnson has put pressure on Ireland to accept his Brexit proposals after hardline Brexiteers and some Labour rebels say that they would back his deal, which could give the Prime Minister a Commons majority for the uh, agreement, if there is to be an agreement. The Financial Times says Mr Johnson has managed to unite the Brexiteers in his party with the plan, uh, but that his deal has received a frosty reception in Brussels. Guardian agrees, the paper says the Prime Minister is fighting a losing battle after the EU's chief Brexit negotiator gave a scathing private assessment of Mr Johnson's Brexit proposal. The I says that the uh, EU is poised to reject the Prime Minister's plans and the Daily Express has a slightly more optimistic note. Uh, the paper thinks that a deal might be close, asking, is this the beginning of the end? Well, a start. Um, Sebastian, is this the beginning of the end? What, what do you think of the... Uh, let's start with the Metro. It, they do it as a sort of Dear John letter. Dear John, here's how I leave the EU. Well, it's quite a clever front page, actually. Indeed, and it sort of symbolised that this is a big moment in Brexit. We've had a lot of these so far, but this is Boris Johnson's final gambit to try and get a Brexit deal so we could leave as he wants to at the end of October. And he gave this very tub-thumping speech. Sonia and I were both there at uh, in Tory conference where the mood is very much pro-Boris Johnson. They love him there. And this speech he gave today really spoke to that. And as soon as the speech was done, and all the activists had left Manchester, he dropped this new Brexit proposal, which went to Brussels in a letter. Mm. And it's very complicated, so we'll try and get through it as quickly as possible. <laughs> Essentially, it is having two borders. So instead of having a border between, say, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, of course, Republic of Ireland is still in the EU, and Northern Ireland is still part of the UK, there would be a sort of a woollier, softer border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, but also a softer border down the Irish Sea. So for customs, it would be between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and for goods and regulations, it would be between the Republic of Ireland and um, Northern Ireland. So essentially, it's quite complicated, and <laughs> this is his last gambit to try and say to you, look, let's get rid of the backstop, go for my two border solution, and we'll find out pretty much, I think, in the next 10 days if this thing's going to fly. Well, what do you think? Do you think it's going to fly, Sonia? I don't, actually. Um, I think um, if you look at the detail of what's being proposed, and, you know, it is enough to give anyone a headache, really, um, it is incredibly complicated. Uh, and if you look at the way, the reaction in Northern Ireland uh, this afternoon, you've got um, several opposition parties coming out against this. You've got the Northern Irish business community coming against it. And in some ways, who could be surprised? Instead of one border and one set of regulations and checks, they'll actually be dealing with two, so it could be it could be really terrible but for them. But does Boris Johnson care about that? He just wants the DUP on board, doesn't he? he? Yeah, that's that's true. So I think um, given that he's got the DUP on board, and he's done that by essentially giving them a, a veto on the arrangements uh, with the Republic of Ireland, uh, because the Stormont Assembly uh, will get to sort of vote on this every four years. Given that he's got them now on board, I think the feeling is in Westminster that lots of the ERG so the hardline Brexit faction of the Tory party will fall in behind uh, the DUP. And if you sort of count in a very small number of Labour MPs as well, that might be enough to get the deal across the table. But that is the Westminster angle. There's also a question of, will the EU yeah. sign up to this? That's now, the big if. <laughs> exactly. And it's while it's true to say, I think that the EU is likely to look more favourably on any proposals that are more likely to get through Parliament, when you look at the detail of this deal, it is still absolutely upfront about the need for some customs checks um, in Ireland. Customs um, checks somewhere. Yeah. Customs checks yeah. somewhere. And that really has been a red line yeah. for the EU. So I think there's still too much distance between where the UK is and what it's offering and the EU. Well, let's talk about the EU reaction, days. Sebastian, because your paper, the FT, they've got Johnson plan unites Brexiteers. Uh, but faces a frosty reception in Brussels. And that does seem to be the mood music coming out of Brussels. Indeed. Well, I'm a little bit more optimistic about this than Sonia because, from my perspective, this was all about 
domestic politics at home because the EU has been in part and willing to negotiate with Mr Johnson because he's never got any coalition together in Parliament to pass a new Brexit deal. That you know, The DUP, um, who support the government notionally, they voted against every single Brexit deal. And within the ERG, that's the big group of Eurosceptic Tories, that lot, plenty of them have also not supported a deal. So by getting this proposal and keeping both those sides on board, plus we've also heard from a number of Labour MPs tonight who said they would also back a deal on these terms. What Mr Johnson is saying to the EU in part is, look, if you if you work with me on this, I can get this through. But as you were just yeah. saying, Ben, when you look at the reaction from the EU side of this, it's frosty, as you know, as kind of how we've described it. Other papers have called mm. it hanging by a thread because the fact is, Sonia's right, there is still a lot of gap between where the EU's red lines are on customs checks and not having any extra border infrastructure on what Mr Johnson is proposing. And, 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 and Dublin's reaction has been pretty lukewarm as well, and that's kind of key, isn't it? Yeah, it is It is very much key in terms of um, what the EU said all along, is that Ireland has to be happy with this. We're acting as a block if we're going to accept the agreement. So, or, or, or to, to strike a deal. So I think that is um, very, that, that, that is a kind of um, a bad sign for Boris Johnson's chances of getting this through. I think there are a couple of problems with this, though. The first First is, is that if you have these very light touch customs checks that, um, that Boris Johnson is, is essentially suggesting in this paper that he's put to the European Union, that really does open the door to smuggling and people getting around the rules because there aren't comprehensive checks. Mm. And if you're the EU, you're going to be looking at that and really being worried about the integrity of, of the single yeah. market. And the second issue with it is, is that to, to, to keep the DUP happy, there is this sort of democratic lock on the agreement. So every four years, there must be some kind of vote, whether it's an installment assembly, which isn't actually sitting at the moment, or some sort of democratic referendum. But um, th but the uh, you know, Northern Ireland must agree to this uh, regulatory yeah. alignment uh, with the EU. And I think again, you know, the e Boris Johnson has said. As part of this agreement, he wants both sides to sign up to never having customs checks at the border in Ireland. But actually, if you um, if you sort of if you're putting this up for debate every four years or so, you could get to a situation uh, where you know the, the, the where Ireland it, Northern Ireland isn't going to be mm. aligned in a regulatory fashion with the um, with the Republic of Ireland and the EU anymore. And you know, not to have customs checks in that situation would be very difficult. It mm. compromises the integrity of the single market. Sebastian, the Guardian have got quite a, a couple of interesting takes. Uh, also, quite pessimistic about the. the Brussels angle, saying there's dismay in Brussels, mm. um, but also saying they feel it's a trap um, and they also ruling out the idea of intensive talks, so-called tunnel talks, where you go in like a tunnel and there's no kind of briefing of the media. You just get on, you negotiate for hours and hours on end until you come up with a solution. That's been kind of ruled out according to The Guardian. For now, and I think the thing we should remember about this is that this thing only came out today and obviously time is ticking. There's not that much time left before the 31st of October and even less time before the final EU Council. And everybody's aware that if there is going to be a new deal, people are going to have to move very quickly. And I think... Mm. What number 10 was looking for tonight was to get this thing received and not dismissed out of hand. So although all the mood music as the Guardian of painting is quite negative, the fact they're saying, look, we can talk about this. And if you looked at what Jean-Claude Juncker said in response to that letter, he was saying there were positive elements to it, but it was still too far away. Mm. The question now is this is an opening bid. This is not the final offer, as some people have suggested, because I think the UK is going to move more on this. It is going to move more towards the EU position. The challenge... Well, the government have said it's the final offer, haven't they? No, but they've, they've, there's been a lot of confusion about this. Some people have said that, but if you heard the Prime Minister this morning, mm. and if you saw the Prime Minister in the hall, he did not say this is the final offer. I think it's very key to realise there's 10 days, really, okay. where this thing could move, and I do think we will see some movement, yeah. and if the government moves a bit more, we go into the tunnel, and then you've got a chance of All getting right. this <laughs> thing through. Let's go to the Telegraph's front mm. page, Sonia, because they're a bit more optimistic, as, as you might expect, as a sort of Johnson-supporting paper, saying mm. there's pressure on Dublin to back the deal, pointing out the DUP agreed to, to the Brexit plan and Labour MPs suggesting they would help get it through the Commons. Sure, but it does all come down to the EU and what the EU says. And I think, um, you know, 
One thing that we need to be aware of in interpreting the mood music that's coming out of the EU is um, they were never going to say no, a hard no today. No. They were always going to leave uh, talks open for discussion. And I actually think, you know, this so-called tunnel phase, I think it's very, very weird lingo, <laughs> isn't it? Um, that we're it's using, just people but, in a room. Yeah, like, that's people, all it you know, is. Going into intensive talks, yeah. as you put it so yeah. well. Um, but I think we will reach that as well because there's also um, an issue of perceptions here and neither side wants to be seen as a side that is responsible uh, for taking us towards a no-deal Brexit. So there was no way that the EU wasn't going to uh, extend some words indicating that it's prepared to talk on the basis of what Boris Johnson set out today. So I think we should be wary about reading too much Do you think they that. really want a deal or would they quite like to see it going to another extension at the end of the month? Um, I think they would like a deal. I think they would like, um, to be honest, Brexit has gone on for uh, three years since 2016. It's dominated a huge amount of, of Europe's time. I think there are definitely member states who, who want the UK to leave as soon as possible in an orderly fashion. But they also want to protect the integrity of the single market. And I'm, what Boris Johnson has put forward today certainly doesn't do that. And I, it's hard to see them compromising towards that, I okay. think. They already see what they've put forward in terms of the backstop. Is now, last question, Sebastian. If it comes to Boris Johnson you know, saying he, he's, he's, he's uh, when it comes to October the 31st, he's, he's going to defy, well, not break the law, mm. but we are going to leave. Mm. What's your prediction about how he's going to do that? Because has Downing Street got a secret cunning plan, do you think? I think if they did, they're not to tell me or Sonia or well, anyone else. Well, They'll exactly. keep it in their back pocket. But look... But some people think, well, maybe they haven't got a cunning plan at all. They're just sort of making out as if they have one. Yeah, my best guess would be the fact is that if this goes nowhere and there's no new deal from that EU Council on the 19th of October and that's the day when the legislation kicks in and Mr Johnson is forced to write a letter. He will do some kind of bravado show, maybe it's two letters, maybe he goes against it to try and get round it. But then at that point it ends up back in the court. We are almost certainly going to be back in the Supreme Court and if they force Mr Johnson to extend and then we have an election he's got the perfect narrative and I think if you look at the slogan okay. of this year's conference Get Brexit Done, that's his election All slogan. Right. I will get it done if you give me a majority of okay like uh, i promise at 11 30 we'll talk about other things other than brexit <laughs> but for the moment sebastian and sonia thank you very much indeed that's it for the papers this hour they'll both be back at half past 11 for another look at the papers So welcome to a look ahead at what's in the papers tomorrow morning and reviewing them today in the studio we've got the chief leader writer for the Observer, Sonia Soda and Sebastian Payne, the Whitehall correspondent for the Financial Times. Welcome to you both. Thank Thanks. you very much for being with us once again. Uh, let's run you through the front pages then. Most of them leading with those new Brexit proposals from Boris Johnson. The Metro goes with the Prime Minister's letters to the EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. Uh, outlining his conditions for a Brexit deal. The Daily Telegraph says Boris Johnson has put pressure on Ireland to accept his Brexit proposals after hardline Brexiteers and some Labour rebels say that they would back his deal, which could then give the Prime Minister Commons majority uh, for the deal if he can get EU support for it. Financial Times says Mr Johnson's managed to unite the Brexiteers in his party with this plan, but uh, also says that his deal has received a frosty reception in Brussels. Uh, the Guardian agrees with that assessment. The paper says the Prime Minister's really fighting a losing battle after the EU's chief Brexit negotiator gave a scathing private assessment of those Brexit proposals from Mr Johnson. And the I says that the EU is poised to reject the Prime Minister's plans. Uh, the Daily Express, though, a bit more optimistic, uh, saying that a deal might be close, and it asks, is this the beginning of the end? So, Sonia, is this the beginning of the end? Big question. <laughs> I don't think so. I think whatever happens in the next two to three weeks, we are going to be talking about Brexit for the next five to ten years in this yeah. country, unfortunately. So it's certainly not the beginning of the end. Um, I guess the question uh, that the Express is really asking, though, is, is this deal going to wash with both the EU and with MPs in Parliament? And it's you know very important to keep 
both sides of, of that equation in mind because a deal isn't going to get through if MPs in Parliament don't back it, but neither is it going to get through unless the EU agrees to what's been set out. And what Boris Johnson has set out in his paper to the EU today is um, what he thinks of as a compromise. The, the Metro, they're calling it a Dear John letter, which is quite a clever front page, I have to say. It is a clever front page, <laughs> indeed. Um, and it, it sort of takes it away from the detail, which is quite head-scratching <laughs> in, in some ways. It's quite a complicated solution that's being proposed here. Um, the idea is that Northern Ireland would leave the customs union with the European Union and would be in a customs union with the UK. Um, but it would be part of the single market, essentially. Uh, so you'd have regulatory alignment across Single market for good, so yes. Single market common for good. Common standards exactly. for good. Exactly, common standards, common regulations for good. And what that means is that you would need two sets of checks. You'd need customs checks on the island of Ireland, between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, and you'd need regulatory checks between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Um, will the, you know... Uh, a big thing that's emerged tonight is that the DUP, Boris Johnson has managed to get the DUP behind this agreement and I do think that there's a chance that with the DUP swinging behind it, that will bring um, some members of the ERG, the hardline Brexiters and the Tory party and perhaps Boris Johnson could get the numbers for the deal through but I think a big question is will the EU accept it and one thing that's very clear is that this arrangement would still involve customs checks on the island of Ireland which the EU has said a red, is a red line um, because of the Good Friday Agreement. And if you don't have customs checks, then that sees the integrity of the single market well, compromise. We'll come to the EU's response in a moment. But how, how do you think this differs from Theresa May's deal that was obviously rejected mm. three times by the Commons? Well, the deal that Theresa May was putting forward was essentially trying to keep the UK closely aligned economically and with trading relations to the EU, even though we were leaving. And, you know, the backstop which she had in her deal, which was the way to stop a hard border on the island of Ireland, was keeping the whole UK in a customs union potentially in Perpetuity, and that was seen as some Brexit as keeping the UK in the orbit of the block after we've left. But the key change here is Boris Johnson absolutely says the whole of the UK, including Northern Ireland, has to leave the customs union because for him and many other Brexiters, they want to be able to strike free trade deals with America, Canada, Australia, you name it. So even though that this actual proposal is quite complicated. It signals a very different kind of Brexit because even though it's still the Conservatives in power, when Boris Johnson became Prime Minister, there was a total clear out from the cabinet and a total change in the Brexit strategy because up until then, the people driving this forward were trying to sort of protect our trading relations and keep them as they are to the greatest possible degree. Boris Johnson, the people who are now running this government, are from the Vote Leave campaign and they want to have a much looser relationship with mm. EU but the looser you make that relationship the more problems you face on the border mm. with Ireland. So I actually think that this proposal today is very serious. A lot of people have criticised Boris Johnson's government for its rhetoric and ramping up tensions and not actually doing serious legal detail. This is serious legal detail. The legal text has been laid with Brussels about how this thing would work in law. The problem that Sonny were laying out is that it does potentially breach one of the key red lines from the EU, which is no new customs checks on the island of Ireland. And Mr Johnson is basically saying to the EU, look, if you want to do a deal, you're going to have to blur that red line. And whether they do or not is going to decide whether this Let, thing let's flies. Let's look at the Express again. Well, we sort of mentioned it. Um, is this the beginning of the end? But they're also saying barnstorming speech at the Tory conference. After that, the Prime Minister reveals his final master plan. So not much um, secret about how the Express see all of this. Now, you've been at the Tory party conference. Um, let's just sort of talk about his speech today. What did you make of that? So was I wasn't in the hall for it. I was watching it. I'd come back to London uh, yesterday, so I was watching it on, on TV, which is actually, you know... It's a very sensible it's a, idea. It's a sensible idea. And if you're a member of the public, all you're going to see are the little snatches, really, yeah. on the news yeah. at 6 and the news at 10. You know, people don't really sit down and watch a Prime Minister's speech at 11.30 in the yeah. morning. You could watch so, it all all on the BBC News of channel. Course, of course, of course. Well, that's that's how I watched it. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, I think in Boris Johnson's own terms, the speech was a success in the sense that it went down well in the hall. Uh, the Conservative activists clearly liked it. 
you know, he's had a fairly good week at his Conservative conference, I would say. But in terms of... He is the of, darling of the Tory party Yeah, but in terms, you know, the, the Conservative Party and voters as a whole are incredibly different. And in terms of a pitch to voters, there was a lot of rhetoric in there. Uh, it was clearly a sort of general election pitch. He mm. wanted to talk a lot about domestic policy. In fact, the details of his Brexit policy were pretty vague in that speech. Mm. Um, but, you know, a lot of the domestic... and There weren't any brand new domestic announcements anyway. And a lot of them have actually fallen apart. So this pledge that there's, you know, the government's going to fund 40 new hospitals actually pretty quickly disintegrated, and it turned out that it was going to be sort of maximum six new hospitals. And, well, they and the say the seed, seed money for the others. Seed money. Mm. That sounds like a euphemism, doesn't it? Um, so, uh, so, so, you know, I thought it was a pretty, you know, watching it as an outsider to the Conservative Party on TV, to me it felt like a pretty empty speech. It felt like there were lots of, you know, fairly mediocre jokes in it. There wasn't a lot of policy. It was Boris Johnson saying, you know, mm. even after the last week, I'm going to bring the country together. But if you look at some of the rhetoric he's been using, Surrender Act, um, the way he approached that debate in Parliament uh, last Wednesday, you've got anonymous cabinet sources briefing to the papers that there's going to be riots or even killings and lynchings if, if, if there yeah, were but, a yeah, second but, but, referendum. That is not, I'm sorry, that is not a government that wants to bring the country together. It's an incredibly divisive and polarised. Yeah, but nor, nor does the Labour government. You know, John McDonnell has talked about lynching ministers as uh, well. And, well, that was back in 2014. And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't excuse no, 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 no. I mean, I would condemn that sort of language yeah. wherever it sits. But the fact is, the last couple of weeks, that's been coming out of the government, not the Labour Well, let, let's, steer, let's steer ourselves back to Brexit, because that's the big issue of the day with these new proposals. And uh, Sebastian, The Guardian have got... The, the EU reaction, and they're quite downbeat about what that Brussels mm. reaction is. They're saying there's dismay in Brussels. Um, they're also saying that the EU think it's a trap, and they're saying that there won't be sort of intensive talks mm. on these proposals, the so-called tunnel talks where they kind of go into a darkened room, but don't go and talk to the media, they don't brief about what's going on, they just stay yeah. in that room until they've got some sort of deal. So yes, and I think this does reflect the fact that these proposals, from my view, are much more about a domestic audience, and as Sonia was saying, the ERG and the DUP are both crucial allies for Mr Johnson, and he got them on board with this deal. And for the DUP, that's actually a big thing, because the DUP have always said no new checks down the Irish Sea. GB, Great Britain, and Northern Ireland have to stay in lockstep. This deal doesn't do that. It essentially is adding more checks across the Irish Sea. But going back to the Brussels point of view on this, it, it's that crucial red line of no new customs checks on the island of Ireland that is being breached here. And the EU said the backstop is not going, the withdrawal agreement's not being amended. They have mm. changed their stance on that a little bit, but the, there is a big gap still there. And I think that mm. if there is going to be a deal, Britain is going to have to move again potentially further towards the EU position. But I think from Downing Street's point of view, they wanted to get this thing out there and they wanted to at least have more talks about it. Now, as you were saying, Ben, we're not in the tunnel, which is when you do a deal in Brussels, you lock yourselves away, taking a couple of church changes and a mug of coffee <laughs> and just stay there for as many days and nights just to get this thing done. Now, whether we get to the tunnel, we'll find out next week because if there's going to be a deal at that EU summit, they will have to have <coughs> that process of taking the two legal texts, agreeing the new deal and then taking it to the 27 member states to get that signed off but i think for mr johnson he can be quite pleased they just didn't say no because he has suggested things in the past where they've just said not interested not discussed well, they weren't likely to just, just say no straight yeah away, i mean I, I think we have to be cautious uh, about reading too much into the fact that the eu said yes absolutely there's something to discuss here although there are problems I think they were always going to say that because this exchange between uh, the UK government and the EU is not just about the realities of the talks, it's also about perceptions and both sides neither side wants to be blamed for a no-deal mm. outcome. So both sides are at least trying to make it look like they're doing mm. as much as possible to get a deal. So I think a lot of hearts will have sunk in the EU, actually, when they saw these proposals, because the reason that they have this red line around no customs checks on the Irish border is because of the Good Friday Agreement. And a lot of experts think that it, it would not be respectful of the Good Friday Agreement and the situation which is, is quite a fragile equilibrium mm. That has led to peace and there will in be Ireland. checks not necessarily at the border yeah. under, under these proposals but we're not quite sure where these checks we're not quite sure where they will be. be and any checks will 
by you know definition involves some border infrastructure. So um, I think the EU will look at that and see that as very problematic from the perspective of the Good Friday Agreement. There's also quite a bit of uncertainty in these proposals. So Boris Johnson has said in these proposals, both sides need to uh, commit to never implementing customs checks on the Irish border ever. But at the same time, there is what's called a Stormont lock. So um, the Stormont Assembly, or by some other means, if the Assembly isn't sitting, which it isn't at the moment, um, there will have to be a, a process by which Northern Ireland agrees to stay aligned in a regulatory fashion with the rest of the EU. So that means that every four years, we're going yeah. to be returning mm. to this debate and it's going to be up for grabs. It's very difficult to see how the EU can sign up to no customs checks forever if you're revisiting this agreement mm. every four every years, four years exactly. because actually if the if Northern Ireland starts to diverge in a significant way from the EU's regulations um, and it isn't allowed to impose any customs checks that just kind of compromises yeah. the whole integrity of the single market. Let's just look at the Independence front page they have Johnson's solution for an open border two borders um, just sort of explain that will you Sebastian? So obviously at the <laughs> moment and um, both it's worth noting Ireland and and the UK joined the EU or the European communities as it was back then at the same time. And EU membership has done a lot to solve the issues as part of the peace process because mm -hmm. the fact you've got the same regulatory regimes, trading regimes, tariff regimes, VAT, you know, every single thing. There, you know, when you go you from don't more... need a border. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now Brexit obviously creates a problem there because part of the point of leaving the EU according to Brexit is to have the ability mm -hmm. to diverge, do things differently, and have extra change there. So the first border you would automatically think would be between Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland and due to the long tensions there, nobody wants to have that hard border and if you listen to the police service of Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. they say that if you put border posts up then they will become a hot spot for potential violence and for paramilitary activities. So. What Mr. Johnson is proposing is to, instead of having one hard border there, is to have two softer borders. So there would be a border um, going between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland for tariffs, for customs and for goods. So if you're selling, um, you know, I don't know, boxes or a, a manufactured good or something, it will have to have a lot of electronic advance paperwork done in advance before it goes over there. The second border is down at the Irish Sea, which is that when things go between GB and NI, they are also going to have to undergo extra <laughs> checks there. So. To ordinary people day to day, it might not look that different. To businesses, it is hugely complicated, mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of extra paperwork to do. But the fact is, this is the kind of thing you're going to need to do if you want the kind of Brexit Mr Johnson wants, given the unique circumstances right. of the province. Uh, let's go to the Telegraph, which is sort of... Uh, well, Mr Johnson writes for it, of course, occasionally, and um, it supports him. And its angle is that the pressure now is on Dublin to back this deal. They're saying the DUP have agreed, some Labour MPs suggesting they'll help it get through the Commons, but it would still need the seal of approval from the Irish Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar. And it's a question, what, what do you think? I mean, the Irish I mean, reaction, like the EU reaction, has been a little bit frosty. Uh, yeah, actually, I think the Irish reaction has been frostier than the um, reaction of the EU as a whole, it's fair to say. And actually, it was interesting, if you look at some of the other political parties in Northern Ireland, like Sinn Féin or the SDLP, the Northern Irish business community too, they've all been incredibly negative about it. And I think it's right to say um, that if Ireland isn't happy, the chances are actually yeah. this, work, this deal won't be um, agreed. And I think one thing that the EU has done quite successfully as part of this process is to act as a block. So there haven't been many people kind of peeling away and disagreeing with the main EU line. And after all, Britain is negotiating with the EU, not with 27 individual member mm. states at the moment, mm. although that will change once we leave. So, um, you know, we heard from Katia Adler earlier on your programme, um, the EU at the moment is sort of staying firm and saying yeah. there needs to be mm. unanimity um, uh, around this. So I think Ireland will be um, very, very significant. Okay. There is other news you'd be amazed to learn in the newspapers tomorrow. Um, one other story that we're going to touch on, which is the statement from the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, um, what the Times call um, the Duke of Sussex's inflammatory attack on the tabloid press. And really, their, their, their angle is that senior royal aides warn the prince about this attack. Um, and they've been mm. rather disappointed that he has been so strong in his language, in his denunciation of the tabloid press. 
Indeed, and this goes back to a story in the Mail on Sunday newspaper um, where there was a letter, a private letter that was published and essentially um, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have just decided they've had enough. Mm. There's been huge amounts of coverage because for papers, any stories about the royal cells stuff and particularly for Harry and Meghan, this has been, a, you know, for, it's been heaven for papers like the Mail to write all this stuff. But they see... It's been a very successful tour, this African tour. Indeed, and the reason that they've obviously done this is they've just got fed up of the press intrusion. And what you see in the Times' is story here, I guess, is the royal establishment speaking back against this because they said, look, you shouldn't have done this now. The tour has been successful. You will distract it and it will become another bickering story. And, and it's now become another story about the royal establishment, which mm. is generally tries to avoid fights, doesn't get into these kind yeah. of rows, and Harry and Meghan, who take a very different approach to this. But the fact they are suing the Mail on Sunday, they're going to fight that vigorously. I'm so it's going to be a real testy battle between the two. And of course, we can't forget this does bring back memories of of mm. Harry and his mother mm. Diana, and a lot of people have drawn the link between how he saw how his mother was treated by the tabloid press in the 90s and how his wife is being treated now. The language, Sonia, in this Harry statement is very strong. He talks about a ruthless campaign against his wife and the press vilifying her almost daily for the last nine months. I mean, I've got a lot of sympathy with him saying that, actually, because I think Meghan Markle has been treated uh, quite abominably by some parts of the British press um, in the last sort of year or so since it, since their wedding. Um, so you can, you can really see where he's coming from. And for me, it's not a massive surprise, actually, uh, that the royal establishment, unnamed royal <laughs> sources, are coming out and saying, oh, we're shot by this. Mm. This is not the way we do things. Of mm. course, it's not the way they do things. They've never done them. But one thing I will say about Prince Harry and, uh, and Prince William they kind of have a more authentic voice, I think, and you. Can, he wrote it himself. Apparently, he wrote it himself. Yeah. Didn't tell apparently. anyone. Recording, you can yeah. you can completely understand his anger. This is a man who, you know, when he was a young boy, saw his mother's vilification by the uh, tabloid press, and now he's seeing another woman that he loves going through um, the same thing. So I thought I can really see where he's coming from. I think the thing we sort of, um, you know, this sort of longer term questions um, about this are. I mean, I don't think there's any question that the private letter between Meghan Markle and um, her father that was published by the Mail on Sunday, I don't think they should have published that. I don't think, I think it was a private letter. I think there were concerns about privacy. I don't think it was in the public interest. I mean, what public interest is there in knowing about the, her private communications with her dad? But this is a very sort of, um, it, you know, the, the legal kind of um, challenge that they've mounted is a very meaty one. And it, it, it is based on the premise of copyright and copyright of personal letters. But doesn't it just ratchet and, up the tension between... Well, I, I, I don't... Uh, maybe, but I think, you know, this is a, a fight he wants to have. You know, good on him. Can he and win it? Is it a fight he can Marvel. win? Perhaps, who knows? But I do think this issue around copyright and private letters may have wider ramifications. Okay. Um, the press have published private letters from Prince Charles before when they were in the public interest. So I think, you know, copyright is an interesting thing. I to just want on. to say very quickly on this. I Ten do, seconds. yes, there are freedom of the press issues here and the ability to report on these things. You know, and we publish leaked government documents and leaked private letters all the time. It's all about the public interest yes. defence on this. Okay. And there that's what's no going to get tested. We've talked about that all night and Brexit but we can't. Uh, Sonia and Sebastian, thank you. That's it for the papers. Good night.